et, et, et bienvenue euh, à, à, à vous. Euh, bien sûr euh, et surtout, euh, très grand merci à Alfredo euh, Brienbourg. Nous sommes très honorés et heureux d'accueillir euh, euh, ce soir. C'est euh, la dernière rencontre d'un programme qui a été euh, très dense cette année. J'ai vérifié, ce sont dix rencontres, Talking Heads, avec euh, autant de, de personnalités euh, véritablement euh, excitantes, euh, inspirantes, questionnantes pour nous et parfois des rencontres euh, qui nous ont véritablement euh, marqués. Euh, plusieurs d'entre elles euh, inscrites dans le champ de l'architecture et de l'architecture d'intérieur. Donc, grand merci à toi, Yann, pour avoir euh, contribué à réunir euh, ou à organiser ces, ces rencontres euh, de très, très belle qualité. Voilà, donc euh, je suis sûr que la rencontre de ce soir eh bien, va clore ce cycle en beauté. Donc, belle soirée. Merci à vous. Merci Jean-Pierre. Cher tous et toutes, welcome and good evening here at the head to this talking head. The last one, as you mentioned, merci cher Jean-Pierre Jean Protémo, si bienvenante. Pour ceux qui ne me connaissent pas encore, je m'appelle Yann Geipel, responsable de la filière d'architecture d'intérieur. Par gentillesse pour notre cher invité, je vais faire l'intro en anglais. I have the pleasure to introduce you to Alfredo Brillenburg our honored guest from, as you are a global nomad, difficult to say which one is your fixed point, Zurich, New York, Caracas. We will come back to that later on. Just a few sentences. Alfredo Brillenborg was born in New York. He spent, as he mentioned, the most important years of his youth in Caracas, nine million inhabitants and the capital of Venezuela. In the 80s, he received a Bachelor of Art in Architecture followed by a Master of Science in Architectural Design from Columbia University. He added to that a second architecture degree from the Central University of Venezuela. Directly after the beginning of the 90s, Alfredo already began his independent practice as architect. He founded UTT in Caracas. Hubert Klumpner joined 1998 as your co-director. UTT is a highly innovative interdisciplinary design practice Obviously, seamlessly oscillating between research and design, one field inspiring the other, anchored in a global context, beside Caracas with offices in Sao Paulo, New York, and Zurich, and with projects all over the world. Brimborg has lectured on architecture at conferences around the world as a guest professor at the Graduate School of Architecture and Planning at the Columbia University. He there, and together with Hubert Klumpner, founded the SLUM, S-L-U-M Lab, Sustainable Living Urban Model Laboratory. And since May 2010, Prüdenborg is more closely connected to Switzerland as he held the chair for architecture and urban design at the ETH at Zurich. You and your partner received some of the most prestigious prizes for innovation, sustainability, and humanity in the built environment category. Among them, the 2010 Ralph Erskine Award for Innovation in Architecture and Urban Design with regards to social, ecological, and aesthetic aspects, the 2011 Holkim Gold Award for Latin America, the 2012 Holkim Global Silver Award for Innovative Contributions to Ecological and Social Design Practices. What can we expect to see today? You didn't tell me too much. You gave a slight glimpse but uh, Alfredo will present the Torre David, a half-built, never-finished 52-floor skyscraper in downtown Caracas, which has been home to thousands of residents who transformed the abandoned block into a vertical favela, complete with shops, tattoo parlors, internet cafes, hair salons, gyms, a church, a taxi system, all invented and conceived, that's why I invited you, without a single interior architect. The question is if our interior architects obsolete? I don't think so. Even so, the transformation to a high degree is poor interior architecture. The research on and documentation of this project did win the 2012 Venice Biennale of Architecture and they're the Golden Lion. For the first time in history, half of the world's population now lives in cities. Cities grow fast, dynamically, and not always in the way governments plan. In particular, in developing countries, 
formal city planning seems to be in contradiction with informal urban development, settlements like so-called and mostly negatively connotated slums that may serve the immediate needs of the inhabitants clash with the plans of those in power. You will therefore present us the urban toolbox, a method and system of thinking designed to empower citizens and city building through active participation of its citizen, or as you say, where every person becomes a creator of culture and history. In our Department of Interior Architecture, we design and reflect amongst many issues on temporary ephemeral spaces, installations, solutions for temporary needs, interventions, expositions, and pavilions. You show a project which goes probably one step further. It's a sort of floating pavilions. The Metro Cable San Augustin in Caracas, an urban, urban car, cable car system, not only being an innovative transport system, but also featuring music, sports, and educational programs. Instead of thinking about urban development as a top-down process, from the drawing board or the decision makers to the street, Alfredo aims to understand informal urbanism and its positive effects on the city as an inclusive laboratory for the study of adaptation and innovation, where communities are actually involved in the creation of the cities. The idea is to create collaborative spaces which allow for knowledge transfer and unforeseen activities and exchanges. In that context, you talk about open structure which can change over time. Embracing and fostering an inclusive bottom-up rather than top-down approach, it is somewhat amusing for me to see that one of your most effective and original projects is actually detached from the city by floating above the city. You brought some examples, which I saw, which will once again show how closely our profession as architects and interior architects is and should be connected to society. It's less about the beauty only of an isolated project or object, but about fostering social life, human interaction. On the other hand, you didn't always to become an architect, but correct me if I'm wrong, first a filmmaker, then a writer, then a politician, then a businessman. So what made you finally become an architect? Did you find out that you will never make a good businessman? Or is it like you said in an interview that as an architect, you combine all these professions, filmmaker, writer, politician, businessman, in let's say a sort of new amalgam? Will we come back to that? What do you think the role of architects, of interior architects is in our society? In Switzerland, we are already in many aspects in a very privileged situation as the country cultivates three cultural regions, three different main languages. You are yourself anchored in Switzerland, in Zurich, but as a creator with an open mind and the ability to observe and sense the needs of a situation, a place, a city and its citizens, you can create projects all over the world. You seem to me very self-confident but you say about yourself you're a very insecure architect and need to discuss your work all the time. Dear Alfredo, it took a little time to get you to Geneva as you're busy with projects abroad, even more delighted to have you finally here with us to share and discuss your work. Even so, Geneva springtime these last few days is not so generous with its temperature. A very warm welcome to you, dear Alfredo. Thank you very much, Sam. Fantastic. Very nice words, very nice words. Well, what can I say after that? Yeah. <laughs> we have a lot to very, say. very good analysis. So, yeah, today, um, what you saw at the beginning was a film we, we've been constantly working on that you saw as you were rolling into the room, which is called Gran Horizonte. But it's as if we make a sectional line cross-cutting the urban planet along a line that we call the political equator. The political equator which separates the north from the south. Um, and why? Because that line, that uh, red line, if you want, what line, right, that, uh, that is so important dialectically that we, the conductus, right, that through our thoughts and our thinking we need to have, it's the line with which we work and we create a, a kind of a vision of our work. 
that red line um, is also a physical space. And that's what we tried to show you in that video, in the three screen video, where you are traversing the world and you're traversing places you normally do not have on your mental map. Having said that, is only to set you up is how do we think globally? If we're not thinking globally, although we're stationed in Zurich, although we're teaching in Geneva, let's say, we've got to, uh, although we want to maybe even practice locally, because traditionally architects and interior architects and have been very rooted to their localities. You know, uh, of course, Le Corbusier was the first global architect. But in general, Alvaralto to Finland to Helsinki, Moneo to Madrid, etc. Architects are very rooted to their localities. Um, however, today, 21st century, the whole profession has exploded. And I will talk more about that in a moment. So as you see, the lecture is called Urban Village or Open Building, because what we're trying to look at is this urban planet and try and understand how we should live in it and what kind of spaces we should live in. But before we uh, begin, maybe a lot of you don't know that when I first arrived in Switzerland in 2010, I lived in Geneva. I was commuting all the time to Zurich. But I thought Geneva, because je parle français un peu, je peux pas uh, faire la conférence en français, mais, mais, mais je peux essayer. <laughs> but um, yes, I had a little house. I lived there with my, my son. We painted in the garden. We even found Caracas cakes with cacao from Caracas. Caracas petit and Caracas grand. So it depended on the population. We found Copacana Cafe. We found Hacienda Bar. Of course, the reutilization of industrial buildings that were left over in, in Plan Palais was fantastic. Or you see here Obama, or what looks like Obama, graffitied on the Plan Palais Park, of course. I understand now it's been totally remodeled. I don't know if those ramps are, are there anymore. But I started to love the, the uh, improvised structures. This is very much about my work, how we can make temporary spaces. I loved the circus that would come to the city. So I liked the way the city would transform during the time of the circus. And suddenly we'd have animals in the city walking around, right? So my question is, why aren't we designing cities that are more playful, more fun, more interactive? That's what I really miss. Well, I think we need to liberate the whole, the whole kind of uh, zoning regu regulations of cities because there's no more work. There's no real democracy anymore. There's no social justice. There's no even legality. Who's legal and who's illegal? Of course, you know about the migrants, the whole story about the migrants and illegality, right? But who's to say that I'm a poor African or I'm a poor Moroccan or, or I'm a uh, Romanian or whatever and I'm not allowed to move across Europe? I'm not allowed to venture to see places, to work in different ways. I believe in a kind of global passport, right? And that should happen. We can't put up walls. How are we going to put up medieval walls and gated communities? Well, unfortunately, that's what's happening. So I was on the street, and I saw this street vendor, curiously, and I like to walk a lot. And he had a sign saying, Vendo tutto y me vado a Cuba. <laughs> <laughs> so... Unfortunately, he didn't know that Cuba's not really the solution. And, and maybe some of you don't realize this, but you've all read this book, at least if you're architects. This book is called Vers une architecture by Le Corbusier. But his first title and the first cover he drew up was called Architecture or Revolution. Why? He was coming from Moscow. He did the Palais of the Soviets. He had seen Ginsburg's uh, buildings, uh, the architect Ginsburg, with his duplex apartment blocks. He changed radically from his, from his uh, um, uh, chaux de fond houses that were quite conventional into modern architecture. And it was Russia that made him do this. And he said, and that's why the cover of this book was, either we make architecture or we're going to get revolution, like in Russia, right? Well, as I say, that guy who wants to go to Cuba is not really solving much of the problem. The problem needs to be solved here in Europe. 
not of necessarily by moving. Why I have revolution in Caracas, it is heavily influenced by the Cuban revolution. It's, and, uh, and this is what it looks like a little bit. I'll just put a little bit of sound effect as I talk. We had to learn how to become architects in the midst of a revolutionary uprising. 18 years, Venezuela has been caught in constant battles of politics. And I was in many of these marches. My friends, you'll see in a second, a very close friend of mine, a woman, going right up to the tanks. Ooh, I don't know why that happened. Well, anyway, that's enough to show you. What, we, what happens is the world is constructing walls, ideological walls. This is a metaphor. This is the Tijuana uh, border between San Diego and Mexico. But those walls are going up even more rapidly ever since 9-11, 2001. And the, that wall is separating, let's say, rich and poor. Of course, the attack on the World Trade Towers, which is what I want to discuss right now, is probably the most significant thing that's happened to us culturally. And if you don't understand that, you didn't wake up to the 21st century. Um, just like the Tour Eiffel was the closure to the, to the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th century, let's say, was another tower that promised technology, it promised rationality, it promised engineering as a great symbol of, of intelligence and science. The Twin Towers now being hit, another set of towers, marks the beginning of a kind of new world, of a kind of uh, intolerance, again, to the separation that 1% of the world population is holding 50% of the wealth of the world. And the other 99 is holding the other 50%. Now, I'm very positive. I still think it's very powerful that the other 99 has... 50% of the world uh, wealth, and we can still do something with that to leverage. But I guess the point is here, you guys as designers, this is a design school, so let's go back into topic. We don't need these Philip Stark funny designs anymore, <laughs> right? You know, they're cute, and maybe they were a symbol of the 90s, but we're over that, this luxury thing, right, of funny shapes and forms. Um, what we need is light. We need to give people light, not lamps. We don't need these gas-guzzling hummers anymore. They might have been cool in some rapper's video, like, you know, uh, uh, but it's not really relevant now to the 21st century. We talk a lot about smart cities all the time, but I question to you, smart for who? Right? Not all cities need high-tech solutions and surveillance. There was a time when the world was trying to, in the 50s, 40s, and 50s, the welfare state was born. And the governments had a strong responsibility to create housing for immigrants post-war uh, in Europe, of course. And, we, and it was a good thing. A lot of people want to blame these houses, you know, for being the wrong type of architecture. I don't really think the problem was in architecture. I think the problem was that they were ignored and neglected. Fifty years later, the things are up in flames, the banlieues of Paris. We all know that story, Right? So, but what do we see star designers doing today? Building these neoliberal cities, which are actually cities for boards and banks and investment houses that have no contact with the ground. They don't even know where the workers are coming from or whether they're dying in the production of these cities, right? So, again, I ask, technology for whom? Financial models for whom? Governance by whom? Do we really believe in government anymore? Do you believe in Erdogan in, in, East, in, uh, in Turkey? Do you believe in Putin in, uh, in Russia? You know, or Chavez and Maduro in Caracas? Forget it. We don't, we've lost our faith in government. So what I believe this 
this whole idea of an alternative government system. Actually, Switzerland's quite advanced in actually putting everything to open debate and breaking down the stages of governance to the local cantons. That's quite interesting. And that's why I'm also interested in Switzerland. Social diversity might be lacking in Switzerland, though. So we have this new planet that we're living in, 21st century, and it's a connected planet. What we do in Switzerland has a direct uh, repercussion in the other places in which you're affecting labor, China, Africa, wherever you're importing materials, fabrics, things, or exporting. So let's take a walk into that urban planet. What we see here is just a one mile drive from, from the airport in Bangalore, in India. And what you see here on the sign is book a villa in peace and serenity. But what you don't, didn't capture is they're going to erase this village that was a makeshift village. It grew over 50 years' time in land, agricultural land around the airport. They're going to erase it. And along that same line, this is one street where we're going on, there's apartment buildings that are called Luxuria, Gold Summit, Water's Edge, Necklace Pride, Greenwich, and then a life full of privilege awaits you, right? Homes that speak of the good life. Is that for the poor? India is really poor. So that whole sequence of development down the main street of, this, of the city coming into Bangalore, probably the high-tech city of India, right, is not for the poor. It's speculation. In fact, all those apartments will probably remain empty. It's just a speculation with the price. Well, it doesn't surprise us. Real estate has always been the vehicle for countries and states and cities to make money. The United States was actually gridded. They drew a grid all across the United States in, in the 19th century and so that it would be populated by immigrants coming from all over, from Norway, from Poland, from Italy, from everywhere, coming to the United States. And there was a famous, not gold rush, but actually land grab. Go get some land. And, and then they would put a cataster to it, and then they would charge you property taxes. And that's how the United States grew. But... We have a situation of the poor in the world now that's quite severe. We have 33% of the world population is poor. And the UN predicts that that's just going to grow. In the next 30 years, most of the people, 2 billion people that will come onto the planet, will go from 7 billion to 9 billion, will be poor. So that's what this chart tries to show you. It's the famous political equator. It's this fictitious line, because it's not the real equator. The line actually would go up and down and around, you know, dividing the world. But what you see is real pixelation of GIS, pixelation of where the poor will be born in the world. That next two billion coming on the planet. So India is obviously the most dramatic case. So we went to India and started to ask a bunch of colleagues of ours, what's their position on poverty? David Chipperfield. So I don't know how you see it. You can see the glass half empty or half full. I'm really optimistic. I actually see it half full. We actually can work towards development. In fact, when we invented this term, informality, informal city, right? It was used from economists to describe informal economies. But we use it 
to say that these areas are places in transformation, are, 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 or let's say are formalizing. They're in formation, right? It's not that they're, it's the opposite of formality and that there's some, that would be out of formality, right? But so what we went on to do was to create magazines, books, the famous slum lab that you talked about. But, and we started to ask friends like Jeremy Till, who runs um, a school in London. Um, and he said, constructed scarcities, because the, the lack of resources, that scarcity, affects every aspect of our lives. We are told that there is a housing crisis, but everywhere we look, there are empty properties. Scarcity here is constructed through the machinations of tenure and ownership. As soon as we understand scarcity as a constructed condition and not an inevitable one, then it makes it possible to creatively intervene in the process that constructs a particular scarcity. So we saw ourselves. The explosion oh, yeah. in your position? Yes, we did. As a matter of fact, we, we heard it, and because and, I was just like standing there pretty much looking out the window, I didn't see what caused it or if there was an impact. So you have no idea on that right now? I have another one. Another plane just hit. Oh, right? oh my gosh. Another plane has just hit in a, another building. Flew right into the middle of it. Explosion. Oh my God, it's right in the middle of the building. So. Either we have a very short memory, because this just happened 14 years ago. Have we forgotten that image, how powerful that is? I think we need to reposition ourselves. I think we need to address scarcity. I think we need to address the poor. I think as designers, there's tons of possibilities to start to make your work more political. Because if governments don't do it, who's going to reestablish the social contract? that Rousseau, who is actually Geneva born, I believe, or around here, Rousseau was, was coming from this area, right? Invented. So if the social contract is broken, we as intellectuals, public intellectuals, have to reestablish it. And I'm sure there are ways to do it with interior architecture. So what I see the architect as, as an interface between these worlds, about between these ideologies, we have the possibility to create a critical median state. It's not the government state. It's not uh, uh, the state maybe in which we live, but actually we're coming from another place. We make this kind of in-between state, which is our cultural output as architects and designers. We take our biographies, our personal biographies, and we combine them with the rationality of response or the strategic response, the logic with which we, a, a solution or a locality gives us. So we create this third condition. As designers, it's not the real world. It's not the fantasy world. It's kind of an interface where these worlds meet. It's kind of, and we use representation as a way. We visualize, right? We get people to understand this critical condition by visualization. And that visualization talks about the perceived space, the physical, what we see, the space we see in the city. The conceived space, which is the mental space that we all have in our heads. And the lived space, the social space, the real space, right? So we formed this group that you see here. This is the original foundational photograph of the urban think tank in the slums of Caracas. But I was coming from building these kinds of houses. There's nothing wrong with it. I mean, these are cool houses. I mean, I was a, I was a conventional architect. But I came to the understanding that that was maybe not the best way to use my talent. Because we come from a privileged class. I already told you 33% of the world is poor. So if we are being educated and we come from society and we have uh, countries that are wealthy, we should actually direct our potentials, our intelligence, our creativity to finding solutions. And it could be right there in Paqui. I'm not sure, or in Plan Palais, where the problem might be. But it's time to re redefine our understanding of urbanization. 
So at that moment, Hubert 9, 2001, after the Twin Towers were hit, we put together a little manifesto. It's in Spanish. But we didn't come here to follow courses of diplomacy. We didn't come here to acquire culture with a comfortable ends. We, didn't come, we came here to confront ourselves with the urban problems, to call things by their name. We cannot maintain ourselves indifferent in the climate of falsehood that constitutes the reality, cultural reality of Venezuela. That didn't make much make friends for us in our own country. And it goes on and on. So what am I doing in Switzerland? Well, I got the very great opportunity to come to this country. And this is our office in uh, Zurich. This is where we grow vegetables. Actually, one of our office members has grown uh, now is hoping that the, that the lettuce comes out and the cabbage and we can have a barbecue very soon. And uh, yes, we are in a privileged place. We're at the, it's called Eteha, Eigenosche Technica Hochschule, right? And the ETH had no tradition of looking at poverty in the architecture school. It had poetry. So there were two ways of dealing with design, let's say. Or there are maybe two rough ways. There's, uh, there's the way that's about more poetic way of dealing with design aesthetics that Zumtor or some of you would know of. And then there's the ethical question. And Godard, another uh, 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 character coming out just there from Lausanne, another uh, Genevois in, in a way, no? Um, he says that the to make a great work of art, it doesn't matter if you begin with aesthetics or you begin with ethics as your uh, departure point. He often began with two. He began with a whole idea of how to splice cinema together, how to storytell in a different way by uh, jump cuts. You know that. That's an aesthetic idea. Or, but he had a very clear social agenda, an ideological agenda with his films. But he said it was precisely how they come together that creates a work of art. So we've brought that to Eteha. We've gotten more political. We're trying to bring those two things together. And we made quickly this little chart where in number one, you had the 19th century Hausman plan. You had cities growing with infrastructure and industrial infrastructure, the 19th century. You had the 20th century was the modern tabula rasa urbanism, overlaying networks, suburbia sprawl. You had infrastructure plans for mobility, trains, planes, right? Grids, master plans. But where are we now in the 21st century? We're in informality, lagos. Uh, Africa, South America, micro spaces, spaces that are uh, under bridges, in cities, squares, unutilized, right? And temporary spaces and reprogramming the existing buildings in the city, like those industrial halls, the MOCA, the museum here, reprogramming what is built. We don't accept anymore going into farmland to build cities. So our architecture and design, at least at Eteha, was only dealing with these three categories, environmental sciences, architecture, and civil engineering. That's really what it was dealing with. But what about all the other ones? Humanities, health sciences, biology, physics, mathematics. We need for the 21st century to create a university around the city, which is multidisciplinary, right? So we have to understand why we do it, Design, we have to interpret what we do as design. We have to understand where we act as designers and identify with whom we collaborate. We are in a time of laboratory, of experimentation, because we don't have enough solutions. The solutions that clients were coming to us for, calling us for, are not really the solutions that are needed in the market. So we need to invent the things that we believe are needed. We need to incubate. We need, just like there was tons of money that was poured into Silicon Valley, right, for the internet to boom and to get to the place where we are today with our thousands of apps on our phone and Uber, etc. We need that same amount of investment to solve the poverty issue, right? 
as I talked about before, the perceived city, the conceived city, the lived city. And what we did was to start to project. We started to imagine these hilltops, areas, because we were in revolution. The people were clamoring for change. There was a real problem in Caracas. So maybe I was lucky. I was in a place where 18 years ago, this topic was put into my head. So I'm fortunate for that. We lost everything in the process. Maybe you guys don't know, there's no private property anymore in Caracas. There's private industry. The ones that are favored by government are the only ones working. All the other ones have been taken away. So maybe you don't realize it because Caracas is not in the news. Because no one wants to mess with Venezuela because it provides 25% of the oil for the United States. So who wants to mess with that? So we started to imagine cable cars, tall vertical buildings for opening spaces, dry toilet stair systems, the manifesto. And here you see a young Hubert, my partner, wearing the manifesto t-shirt trying to sell it because we were making a living by trying to raise funds to do the projects we really wanted to do as designers. We didn't have any clients at that moment. It was all a garage startup. But the first thing we did was map our city, our locality, to show where the poverty was. So 60% of the population of the city was living on 40% of the territory. And then we went on to map Rio de Janeiro, which has pockets of smaller slums. And then Bogota, which has along the periphery, because it's a valley, it's a mountainous valley, right? And then uh, Buenos Aires, also pockets. And then Tijuana, as you saw. Why do you guys think that Tijuana has the poverty just like that, right below the line of the United States, of the border? Because it's doing maquilas. It's constructing the vacuum cleaners the Americans buy, the, the refrigerators the Americans buy. And so to build those factories, those maquila factories, a lot of poor people had to come in as laborers. And when they came in, there was no plan. Government has no anticipatory plan. Or Mexico City, where the poverty is right dead in the center of, Me of Mexico City. So this is what that looks like, because poverty usually is, is in the worst areas. And so it floods. This is Sao Paulo flooding every year. So what we tried to do was debunk the myths of poor neighborhoods. Poor settlements are not the problem. They're the solution because people have a right to a home. They're not illegal because they've been living there for 40, 50 years, et cetera, et cetera. So they have a right to the city. They have a right to infrastructure. They have a right to housing. And so we went and created this slum lab. Of course, we take slum. It's a bad word. No one likes it. It's been used for pro and against. But we took slum lab as a sustainable living urban model lab. We turned it around, the acronym, to invent a laboratory for these explorations. Because we knew that architecture was spatializes and materializes uneven development. And as a profession, we knew that architects had been complicit in the project. If you're going to build a shopping mall or a tower, a luxury tower for someone, or a private home, a beautiful villa, you are being complicit in the process if you're not obliging your client to think beyond that. Can he put a public water fountain? Can he give a little bit of his property up for a community garden? Can the tower have 30% of an open theater or a public space given back to society? Right? Why? Because you get Caracas. Caracas grew exponentially from the 1950s to the 1980s in GDP growth. So if economists are telling you, no, it's very good that we incentivize in, in, you know, uh, the top corporations to invest in our cities. You can have GDP growth, and you can have growth of poverty at the same rate. As I'm telling you, that's why 1% of the world population holds 50% of the wealth. So we made a book of ideas to talk about how this absent infrastructure and investment calls into question distributive issues of equity, access, and social justice. So we started to make some principles. Diagnose topography. Visualize social factors. Diagnose morphology. Reverse engineer aggregation. Capture resources. Add infrastructure. 
And the question is not whether one little building is sustainable because we put a bicycle rack, we collect rainwater, we put a little garden on the roof. That's not going to cut it. What's not sustainable is the amount of poverty that's now visible in the world. Right? So we start with a city idea. We call it urban village, right? Urban parangole. This is a map of London, for those of you who don't know. But London was based on cities, on little villages. It has a medieval structure. It's Chelsea, um, you know, Knightsbridge, all these places, uh, 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 Sloan Square, are little villages. And here you see it with the heat map. And what the heat map is telling you is the amount of activity that's happening where in London. But if we zoom in, you're going to see that that amount of activity is actually not a grid. The streets are all broken. It's creating lots of corners and lots of intersections where people go to pubs, cafes, things, street corners. It's not right. Why are we building cities on grids when we have GPS, when we can navigate, right? So we made a little experiment. We said, let's take a one-mile radius city. Let's take a subway station, a train station, and a bus. Let's declare it an experimental zone. It's like if we took here, right down to the lake, Cornava. Let's get rid of the cars here. I mean, can't people walk? Of course we can walk 10 minutes. That's more or less what it takes to walk a mile, right? And so we can walk or we can put other means of transport for people, like taxis and things. But we don't need cars. And that city, obviously, because we have density, we're going to have to go vertical in that city. But the whole ground floor of that city should be open and public. And maybe the, uh, up on top, we incentivate people to connect buildings, right? This is for a model of Sao Paulo or Calcutta or Mumbai, right, that's going very vertical. And then we don't, why do we need elevators in every building? Maybe the elevators are public extensions of the metro, public infrastructure. Maybe Schindler has sky lobbies, etc. And we connect them, one elevator. And then why are we building every floor? Why don't we build every two floors, save money on concrete? And then the in-between floor, companies can build volumes inside in steel structures, right? So one elevator can start to connect different floor plates, different functions. We can traverse cities on different levels. We can bring the street up into the air. So then we suddenly, with our GPS and our thing, we can traverse, go to the cinema, go down, go around. Actually, I'm not telling you this is a future city. It's actually happening in certain parts of the world. And then we incentivate people to be able to, you get incentives to go up if you connect etc. Then we could study whole mobility. Then we have electric elevators, uh, I mean walkways, uh, conveyor belts, bicycles, tuk-tuks, and we invent a whole mobility system that you can see on your app and you can catch. And then at nighttime you can see that city. You can see and identify what's the public and what's not public. So you know where a party is on another floor, right? So we started to simulate that city. And then we even, uh, we even created a little kind of video as people were building that city. I guess in all the epochs of the world, the Arctic's been subject to a worldview, right, of those in power. Before, it was kings. Now, it's corporations. The Arctic, by definition, had to identify himself with power even transforming himself into an operative appendage of power. But we need to question architects' credibility. Are we just decorators, uh, uh, was said by David Chipperfield, and our representation in society. As a renewed discussion is necessary, we have to reframe the term of 21st century architect, right? In the time of these temporary and informal spaces. Architects now must exploit circumstances for public good while weathering unpresented changes like we saw with money, resources. Um, the city is full of possibilities. It's a laboratory. 
It conducts high-risk experiments, right? And that's what we want these kids to do in this video. They're conducting experiments on a given city. We need to learn from these emerging intelligence of what's going on in Mumbai, what's going on in, some, in Chinese cities, for instance. And we need to adopt an ethical stance. We need to call for environmental and social justice, diversity, equity. We need to find opportunities. We need to design environments that act as a foil for new governance processes, for new protocols, for new relationships. We need to reorder the urban system and shape lives differently. We need to reframe the discipline of inventing modes of practice in productive margins of the discipline, our discipline of design. We need, to, we need to claim new territories of design that were given up. We need new legitimacy. We need new thinking processes to affect the city and lifestyles. We need to be like urban agents that are using subversion. We need to infiltrate. We need to stimulate. We need to simulate. We need to operate legitimately because we don't want to break any laws. But we need to insert ourselves in the blind spots of emerging civic governments, organizations, and power structures to create peripheral thinking, peripheral disciplines, combined peripheral differences as observers to leverage, to create new vantage points, to inflect decisions and policies. So, as we move on, now we can start to see some of our work. So, we went to Athens as the first place of crisis in Europe. You know that Athens is burning. So why couldn't that be the per first place to test our ideas? People on the street, abandoned buildings, right? So we took an office there where the X is in Omonia Square in the downtown circle that actually connects the traditional city and the old, uh, let's say, uh, institutional uh, city with the expansion city of the 21st century. We took an office, we started to call people, we gave lectures, we had a debate, we looked at immigration, and the immigration on this map, there's Ammonia Square, this is the area, most of the red is where the immigrants live. So the zone is clearly established. We looked at listed buildings, cultural buildings, archaeological spaces, traffic flow, qualities of life, vacancy of buildings, elderly population, public space. We mapped it all out. What you see here is all the empty buildings in the downtown of Athens, either closed up, boarded up by private investors, or actually um, government buildings that is closed up. We started to map the public spaces that you see in, in yellow, the cultural buildings, and how, and you will see, and then the traffic flows, right? You'll see more maps. And we started to realize that there was very little cultural offer in the areas of the immigrants and in the poor areas of Athens, right? And so I won't bother you. But we started to see the potentials. And we came up with ideas for these empty spaces with the mayor of Athens. W wherever there was an empty space, we said, come on, we can uh, stimulate to create a theater, an outdoor theater. Why not? The Greeks are very good with tragedy, right? So we can start to make makeshift theaters. And then we can take parking lots and we can build these kind of open structure buildings that can change over time. So right now they have to be homeless shelters, but in the future they can be startup companies. And the train station. How can we not have a city that has a good train station? Right now Athens has four lines coming into it, right? But we can connect it to Rotterdam. We can connect two ports. We can do a high uh, speed train system, right? And instead of putting it full of Starbucks and shops, we can make a, a university, a, a technical university in the top floor of that train station. So it can pay for it too, right? And we bring social awareness. We make 11 tracks. Then we went to Utrecht, where a group did call us and said 
These were the mothers of the third age. They were immigrants. They were being evicted from a place in Utrecht, where, which is an island here. It's flanked by highways and by, by a, a, a canal and by the train station up north, up top, right? And it had some rebuilt old blocks, and it had fantastic diversity. It has fantastic diversity and immigrants all living together. And they wanted to kick them out because they were owned by cooperatives, which are private public companies that own these housing cooperatives. And we said, don't knock them down because the land values had risen so much that the corporates wanted to make a killing, move people, the immigrants, out of the center of the city. And we said, don't do that. Make high-end apartments on the top of the buildings. And so we started to look how we could retrofit those apartment blocks and add new new. Uh, uh, um, walkways and new living rooms and add new kitchens, right? And add new rooms without destroying those blocks. And we added everything that's in orange onto the building, right? And then we added new stair towers and elevator banks because there's old people and they were walking up. But now the immigrants who came in the 50s to build post-war uh, Holland, they were old now. And so we took those buildings and we added the new top apartments. And this is basically what we added, very simple. And we plugged it in to the apartment. And we created a whole new idea of transparency, of looking in, of walkways, of being able to see. And then to compare that to Caracas, we dreamt in Caracas of having a cable car of having the pedestrian city on these informal hills of a mountain full of houses, or what we like to say, one house the size of a mountain. Because people were working collectively. So we said, let's just give them hubs, subway stops. But instead of building a subway, let's give them a square and a station full of social activities. So we dreamt, we made a quick collage, a collage and visualization. We rallied about 300,000 signatures to, or to get that built, but they didn't let us do it. It took us 10 years. So we, we built first stairs, then we built uh, crossways, then vertical gymnasiums. We started to stack sports fields one on top of the other. And we made it a kit of parts so they could be prefabricated in sh and then built very quickly so that we didn't ruin the little soccer fields and we could build them in three months and put them together. And then we made a school for autistic children. There was no school in Caracas for autistic children. One of my friends had an autistic child and went to the municipality begging to make a special school. So we went with her and we found land and we uh, sourced it. We got the funding together and we built the school. But we didn't have the right kind of land. We had only a small little plot and you can't build an autistic children's school in vertical because they can't coordinate. They can't go upstairs. They can't go up in elevators. They get claustrophobic. One teacher has to take two kids up to the classrooms. So we made a building like the Guggenheim. We made it like a ramp system. We wrapped it around the classrooms. The kids now see where they're going. They can look in. They lose the claustrophobia. They walk up the ramp. They look at the trees and nature all around them. Here you see them going up to the classroom. Oh, sorry. I have to go back for a second. Give me a, give me a second to go back to that because you might like some of this. So what does all of that look like? That's what you're going to see in a moment. So we need to create feedback loops. We need to create, oh, we can put a little, little soundtrack. We need feedback loops. We need the, our partners to be in the field. We need to connect with NGOs. We need to connect with social workers. I sometimes feel I'm a social worker. I need to go to bankers. I need to find funding from foundations to build the kinds of projects that we... I'm becoming an urban agent, right? To restructure the assumptions of what an architect should be and to question the way we live. And we need to, maybe like Giancarlo Di Carlo, a great Italian architect in the 1960s, he questions whether, whether architects really were looking at the right clients. And who are the clients of architects? It's the people 
you're trying to serve, whether in a hospital, a school, a neighborhood. Your clients are not the people paying for it. Your client, in fact, people should pay for things and necessarily give the right to you to figure out what's best because the client is, is people, right? We cannot become an elitist profession. Maybe there are other moments in the history of the world, right? The 90s, globalization, that's when star architects were made, but we don't have to be star architects now. We have another problem. So we're gonna create a new kind of architect that's fitting for the turn of the 21st century, where we do know clearly that we're in a crisis. In 15 years, climate change is irreversible. So, What you're looking at is the cable car stations with plug-in uh, libraries on the side of them. It goes for 2.4 kilometers. It flies out of the subway system. It has names written on the, that we did with Rudy Bauer, who was just here. He's a professor of your school, um, graphic design. And we worked, and they all connect. And it's, in fact, the most exciting thing in the city now. The worst neighborhood in Caracas became the most exciting neighborhood. So now I take you to imagine a little bit more. So in the 60s, there was this guy called John Habraken. He's from Holland. So nothing that I say about an open building is new. So we need to relive history. So if I first came to architecture because I loved aesthetics, and yes, I was taken by Corbusier, Fenetre en Longueur, the, f the five points, the pilote, the raised house. Of course, I love that white architecture. But... Then, as I, my practice when I encountered realities, politics, economies, etc., I started to reformulate and took a more, let's say, ethical position. And now I'm rethinking the whole thing and trying to figure out what my place in history is. So I'm trying to reconnect with history because we're not teaching history appropriately. So now I'm going back to reconnect with the people who actually in the 60s and 70s started a whole revolution of thinking. But they couldn't continue because the 70s oil crisis came. And John Habracken invented on scripted paper, he said, let's plan a building that has a square in the middle, it has a thickness, and it has stair systems and circulation diagrams, but basically it leaves all the apartments open. And you can configure your own apartment as you see fit. So we just build the framework for the building, and, you, and each client reconfigures his interior. I brought that all for you, right? And so, but Corbu, of course, already was thinking of this. He did the domino house. Why is the famous image of the domino house open like that? Does anyone know? Anyone have any idea why the domino house is open, shown as open slabs? Of course, it was about the creative structure, concrete slab structure, right? It was the predominant modern tool, but it's open because this is 1917, this is social housing. He wanted people to use the, any available material on the ground to, from the war to fill in the walls. He didn't care what was it filled in with, right? So the Pritzker Prize winner of this year was Fry Otto, he just died. So in elegy of him, what you guys didn't know is that he built an open house. This is the way it looks at the end after he invited his friends to take an apartment in the open structure. The, here you see him, and the open structure is this slab system. You see it very simple. And then he worked with each individual house owner to create a differentiated house. Well, then we started to think about this, and we created a building that we call this kind of vertical barrio, which is a neighborhood not a slum, a neighborhood, which is clusters of apartments that work together as a family with an open street running through the building. And you can connect those streets with other buildings. And we tried that out. The Anglican Church in the, in the 99 uh, rain uh, crisis where 100,000 100, people were displaced in Caracas, we tried out that open structure. And here you see it. The only place we could do it was on top of the parish church house. 
So we built the structure over the house as if it was building over a dwelling, a slum dwelling. The idea was to verticalize a building that could grow. We called it the growing house. There you see the parish house. And then upstairs, apartments. Now those apartments were an open slab with steel structure so you could cut inside. And we gave, as an architect, the brief. We made the brief of those apartments. We designed those apartments roughly, but people could build those apartments as they wanted to. But we imagined this building going up vertically. And here you see more renders. And then we got the chance with the city to build it. In 2007, it was under construction with foundations, but we were in the worst political crisis. And unfortunately, uh, we had a, a little bit encounter with the government because we worked for both government and we worked for, uh, we worked for opposition to government mayors in both sides. And we were caught in the middle because as architects, we don't take positions. We're connecting the city together. But in that moment, um, we did take a position to not endorse the government because we thought that 18 years is a little long for a dictator, right? For a one-party rule. So uh, we were not able to finish that building. So if the city is people, and people are your clients. We went directly to the people. We started basketball tournaments. We started to work with our old nannies, the nannies' grandchildren, um, some of their uh, uh, office workers, etc. Our motorcycle guy who delivered mail in the office to figure out how we go in here, how we find a passport into these areas. And then we found out it wasn't so bad. It was actually more exciting than the formal city. And what you see how is five years in between two structures. And if you give people time, they finish an, an apartment beautifully. If you give them time. They don't want to uh, get a little social housing uh, container in a, in a generic building. What they want is to build their own city over time. Now you would say, that can't be done today. Well, it should, because half the cities we love in Europe were built over time. They were medieval structures. They were built by approximation. That's why we love the, down, the, the center of Zurich, the old town of Zurich, because the spaces are all kind of interesting, right? So spatially, the places we like are not the places we're learning from. So this is Henaro. Henaro and his, had, and his brother built that city. These are archival photographs of them laying out the levels on the hill to build these houses for the immigrants. And first they began as shacks, but then over time, 30 years, they became serious concrete structures filled in with the cheapest available material. But give it 30 years more, it'll be retrofit with all the technologies, and they are with all kinds of technologies. So now we come to the famous Torre David. So as we were looking at the periphery of the city, we suddenly found this gigantic 45-floor building in the middle of downtown Caracas that suddenly looked like a slum, but we went in to find out it, what it really was. And we found out it has a permanent solid structure, cuts concrete floors. We found out it has water, sewage, electricity because they put it all in. They paid for the tariffs. They got the city to connect themselves. It's located in the downtown of Caracas, and people are working in the one-mile radius from the building, you know, in informal jobs, of course. And it's relatively safe for what it is, and you'll see in a second. So the, by definition, it's not a slum, because a slum, by the U.S. standard, is far away from water, sewage. It's far away from mobility systems. It's disconnected, et cetera, et cetera. So why was this tower abandoned in the middle of Caracas? Well, a developer tried to build the icon for the city. He had this dream of building this icon for the city in the 90s, but the revolution hit. He got caught in it. His bank folded. His company folded. Actually, he died from the stress. He had a heart attack. So the building was confiscated by the city. So this hardware, which was the concrete structure, lay standing 17 years in the city. It was a fixed structure. And then people started to move in and adapt the building slowly over time. And it, made, it became like an ready-made, an appropriated ready-made, right? A little bit like Duchamp. 
So when we took that building as an example of architecture to the Venice Biennale, we took it knowing about Duchamp's move. When he put the urinal in the museum, he was actually questioning what's art. What are the limits of art between the ready-made and the art artifact, right? And then when we Torre David, we put it into a question, what is architecture? And where's the role of the architect, right? So if you look at it from the outside, it might look a little disastrous to you, right? But they actually were clamoring for help. They wanted to figure out how to finish the facades. So we started to help them for one year. We went inside. We did a whole photography exhibition with the residents, right? We started to look where they worked. We mapped out the one mile radius of the city. We mapped out where they were living up to the 22nd floor and 25th floor. We looked at the solar exposure to see how we could bring sun and wind power to it. Microsystems, water stations, so that people would have little water tanks all connected between pumps because it had to be cheap so that it could be executed by them. We talked to Schindler to bring in an elevator and Schindler wanted to know how people lived in a building 25 floors in the air without an elevator. So we imagined that building on the top with wind energy and with new green parking lots, with, with food production, with outside elevators. And some of the photographs, how people built their units. They went in with paper walls, with raw brick. And over time, this is Gladys, by the way. She was our passport into the building. And these are the two daughters. And Gladys tells you what she aspired to was a good middle class life. It's no mystery. They weren't, you know, and they, they wanted the right to the city. And they said to us that it was better to squat a building abandoned in the center of the city for 17 years than to go to the hillsides and create more ecological problems by building more slums and barrios on the hillside. So they put shops in every couple of floors. They organized the building into clusters. They were very smart. They had a basketball team in the bank lobby. Right? They played other basketball teams in the area. Right? They organized it. But, and we helped them, some residents, before the whole story turned sour. We helped some residents fit out their apartments. And look at what they could do. It's just a regular apartment with interesting interiors, with the cheapest available tiles they could find, probably discarded tiles. Who cares? Right? And then we wrote a book about it. And then... Unfortunately, the government stepped in and evicted about 50% of the population with a gunpoint and offered them housing 65 kilometers outside of the city. Now, a lot of people ask me, wasn't that terrible? Well, no. Actually, they were, do they were activists. They were squatting this building to get a right to housing. Now the government gave them housing, not the best housing, the most stupid housing in the world, 65 kilometers in the middle of nowhere, but they're going to take that house because it was for free. They'll sell it, and they'll come right back into the city. <laughs> so the story's not over as it never is in India, Africa, or South America. So we started to imagine the same idea of the tower organized in clusters. And we imagined new forms of towers and architecture that could be these kind of new social housing open structures, right? And then we said, what's the easiest thing we can do? Parking lots. Parking lots are the perfect open structure. So we said, wow, there are going to be a lot of parking lots in the world empty. And we can turn them into anything. Why? Because we're going to have electric cars. And maybe we won't even have cars. We'll have lots of cars, mobility cars that you just rent. So parking lots are perfect. And they adapt to different shapes and forms, right? And then we found some parking lots that were illegally transformed. Here you see a parking lot with offices. And then we went on to see parking lot with all kinds of growing food plants in the planters all around. Quite interesting, right? And then we... Then we programmed a shelter idea. The parking lots for Turkey, for instance, that has earthquakes, could become shelters, hubs, helicopters could come, energy hubs. They could be used in different ways, right? And then we said, no, but maybe we could make parking lots like a village, like a cluster. How would that be? So we took the right population, the right size of a vill little village cluster, and then we put a ramp, like a parking ramp that would go up. Then we said, maybe this ramp 
in the beginning can be bicycles for motorcycles. You could park it. Maybe it's just a deposit. And then you can turn it into a shop. Then you can turn it into a home, right? And then we thought that we just simulated how that structure would be occupied. Cars in the middle, squatting tents, and then over time, green infrastructure, solar energy, wind tunnels, facades, shops. And then we took that and we started to play a game. We started to play a game as if each one in our office had some rules and they were residents. Where you would put your shop, where you would put your house. And then we took an empty lot here and we densified it and we played that game over time. So this is the kind of stuff we do. We are in the intersection between practice and theory. We do theory and we construct a kind of game or theory around our work, but then only to implement. Our interest is implementing. So let me show you some of these open structures that go in different scales. This is San Francisco. We decided that San Francisco was the beat generation. I'm very influenced by Kerouac, by Ginsburg. I was very influenced by this free kind of idea of, of, of poetry, of society. And so I said, let's make a rolling parking structure that occupies two parking spaces. We asked the city, you know those parklets? San Francisco invented the idea that you can rent a parking space for a limited amount of time and put anything you want on it. So I thought that it would be great to make a poet's corner. Why? Because just up the street where I placed it in San Francisco was the place where the beatniks lived. And Ferlinghetti, the great poet, was there. So we thought, okay, we place it in the parklet and we have people clustered outside our structure. It's an open structure. People can come out. They can interact with the office building. And here you have, we have tents. We have roofs. We can do projections. We have seating. And here we were constructing it with the students in a workshop. And, oh, I forgot to put the final picture of it. Well, that's so much for that. Then we went on to Barcelona, and we were asked to do a commemorative uh, piece of architecture. Actually, some of our architects from the office over here that worked on many of these projects, Alexander Zevurdakis, Helle Bendixson, and, um, and Claudia, she might have gone now. So what you see here is when Bohigas, in the 1980s, the famous architect, connected the, the, the beach of Barceloneta connected it to the port of the city and to the city. A great move, a, a urbanistically great move. But what you don't know is that what he did was where he put this square, no one used it because he made a tabula rasa and he destroyed all the restaurants that were there in Barceloneta Beach. It was called Chiringuitos. So I was asked to do a project that would commemorate 300 years of the liberation of Barcelona. So of knocking down the walls. So they gave me this site, and I said, okay, I work with history, and I work with activation of public space. So I made a structure that was reflecting the houses that were once knocked down. So it's a comment to my, to my predecessor, Bohigas, that he erased memory, but I was bringing that back. So with that temporary structure, it could be used for market, for children playing, etc. and we called it Rayuela because it was the year of the commemoration of Julio Cortázar, who had written a great novel uh, called Rayuela, Hopscotch, right? Hopscotch is a game children play. But if you know the novel, it's also only at the end of the novel do you understand the history of the, of the character in the novel. So it's a little bit only if we understand history will we be able to design better. So at nighttime it would become used for different things, for discos, and you could then, when the project was all over, it could be relocated as public space. And then the whole thing was constructed with the, with the recuperated sails and fishing nets from the fishermen. And here you see the walls out of earth, sand and earth that we did as contrapesos, counterweights, so the structure would not fly away. We became places where people could sit. They became soccer goals. At nighttime, it became places for parties, etc. And people played with it all along. And it was a very soft way to infiltrate, to make a comment on the politics of Barcelona. Um, maybe... Maybe I can skip this music building because you saw it. It's a Brazilian project. And um, 
we went into the worst favela of Brazil. I'll just show you this diagram. We can't make master plans anymore. It's too big. So what we can do is acupuntura urbana. We can make acupuncture hubs, like Wi-Fi hubs. We can bring program, culture, health, social housing to certain areas and then let the rest of the areas upgrade slowly. So in the worst area, we decided to put a park. And then on top of that park, a music school. Why? Because you know the Brazilians, they love music. And we found that they had, the faveladores had started a little youth orchestra. So we built that uh, music school with an outdoor theater and the whole bowl recuperates the rainwater so the building works with the landscape and the theater is part of the building. So it becomes all one connected work. So architecture now starts to extend itself into the landscape. It can't work without the landscape. And here we are opening the first holes, the projects under construction. At this very moment they're clearing the site. And then we went to Barranquilla, and maybe with this project I'll end. And we, Barranquilla didn't have a music school, uh, sorry, a, uh, a school for Carnaval. Because Carnaval was a great tradition, Barranquilla has it, Trinidad and Tobago has it, and Brazil has it. But Barranquilla is a great old tradition of it. So we were asked by the community to have a craft school to build the masks, the musicians to play, and so, because we know the nature of South America, our designs go into the structure. Forget the walls, the walls we also program and the closures we program, but we build the intelligence into the structure because we know engineers won't change it once they stamp the structural drawings. What happens with the rest of the building, we don't really know. So here we are dealing with it, and this is the school for the Samba. We place, it's called EDA. It goes right in downtown, right next to an old factory. And we connect to that old factory. We build it inside the factory. So we're reutilizing old buildings. It's a building that has a stair system. And then we build it over a ceramic vault. Because we want to revive and have people be conscious of the way the Boveda Catalana used to be the way that industrial naves were built and cities were built before with, with uh, ceramic. And the building's quite simple as all our architecture. As I said, it's a structure with holes in it. It has a clean form because we want to be able to reproduce these buildings anywhere. The music school can be shifted, the vertical gym can be taken to other places, and this uh, school can also be taken to other sites. It has a very clear dimension fitted for uh, many sites. As you see it turning, it's an open structure, again, for education, as you see, with different circulation patterns. Here you see uh, the treatment of the concrete. It's built in concrete. It has trees on, and it's a prefab system, a kit of parts that comes together and forms the building in slabs, all prefabricated so we can build it very quickly. This is an interior of the classrooms. Here you see sections of it over the barrel vault. Here you see the barrel vault technology of how to build it. This is the theater underneath where the samba school or where the carnival school can practice and the building is over, over and above, right? And, and of course, the whole surface of the, comes right over the, the theater and the, and the closure of the buildings will be like almost in beaded nets of color also built by the craftsmen. And um, yes. So are we, how are we for time now? If you want to show the film, then we should slowly come to okay. the last project. So I'm working in Africa now. And I'm just coming back from Africa yesterday. Believe it or not, I landed yesterday, so I'm a little tired. But Africa is actually the place where we should all be working. As uh, Edgar Pietese says, it's an African urban revolution right now. Because it, we need to assume that Africa's 
is taking a more central position in the urban imaginary of theorists and architects. Why? Because you know what's happening in Lampedusa, a boat uh, trying to reach the shores of Athens or trying to reach the shores of Italy, right? People, the fastest way to get out of poverty is by migration. So if Europe doesn't want that problem, it's got to invest in Africa. It can't put up walls forever. And so this is the downtown CBD of Cape Town, the most luxurious city in all of Africa. It's right. It's a, it's a wonderful city. It's limited. But on the outskirts of the CBD is 2,700 informal settlements of 7.5 million living in poverty, right? And the government, although it had good intentions, apartheid had really good intentions to build houses for the poor. And Mandela actually promised houses for everyone. They can't build it fast enough. So we have a huge challenge. How do we build fast, good, and, and, uh, and cheap enough, right? Because people are having fires. They're, they're, they have kerosene lamps, which, would the, which they're using for cooking, and they fall over at night for heat. So how did this all happen? Well, you guys probably heard of apartheid planning. They actually planned neighborhoods for white, for colored, and for black, right? And then... Those neighborhoods were established all on the outskirts. You have Mitchell's Plain, Kailisha, where we're building, the furthest down. But is apartheid over? No, it's not. Here you see the segregation. The three colors show you the segregation of, of classes in Africa, in Cape Town today. So although democracy did win, and they clamored for decent housing for all. They can't build it fastest because the type of house they promised was this one. And it's a suburban house. It has no density. And it can't be done fast. And it's ghettos, right? You're building ghettos. So there's a big gap of 2.5 million housing gap. So what do we do? So I think that we can solve that housing crisis. We just have to think different. So I went in with an NGO that invited me. Um, in to look at it to a small little community and I walked around walked around for days until I found this guy who had built a double story shack and why was that so amazing why because he added value to the value of his land by densifying you add value more floors right so people don't know how to build two and three floors so if we help them and with this NGO, and you see Ikailami and Andy Bolnick right at the center of that, we, we started something called Block Yon. Maybe we can just move the shacks and give them nice shacks. But I said, Andy, we've got to do something a little bit better. We can't just give them the tin shacks. So I said, let's make a solar shack. Let's empower them. Let's call it the Empower Shack. But let's make it several floors. Let's give them the possibility to rent on the bottom floor. Let's have a, or a shop or something. So we found this guy called MK, and he's actually offering services of construction, plumbing, and, and all these things in the bottom of a shack. And so we put together the Empower team at ETH. We put together solar, we put together toilet uh, sanitation, uh, apps, a tablet app, and we put together structure, and we put together... Um, social workers and we played a game with the community so we said okay where would you like to live and so if you could arrange your house where would it go where would it do and we asked them questions we took the data we measured the site every house we we uh we made and we started to play if by moving the shacks by liberating properties by putting them in three different shack sizes if we could liberate land and we could we could make squares and public squares public spaces so oh sorry i think this is on automatic yeah there it goes so we made this app at eth which actually you put in the project, you go to the site, you use a Google map, it gives you the site dimension, then you can draw roads into it, you take it on site 
with the inhabitants. You work with them. You show them that this could change. And actually, you empower them to think differently about their own reality. And as you're working with the community, as you're measuring them, as you're relating people together, as you're having this, this kind of interaction, you're putting them together. You're making them a stronger political voice. So they don't get erased, so they don't get moved out of the city. And then you say, well, what kind of house would you like to live in? How much can you pay? You look at their income. You figure out the size of house, and then you move them slowly over time. You cluster them together. You put in their names, you, and then you have three forming a cluster. Four, you move it in, and then you start to create roads, accesses, and then at the end of the day or the end of the week, you have a plan that you can say, these are the people, this is their, how much their income is necessary, etc. Let me know, the people in these communities, are they having Wi-Fi? Are they having like iPads? They, or they um, need you? Many of them, in, in, well, there's about 10 of them out of, out of 78 families, 10 of them have already uh, dishes, satellite dishes, and about 15 of them have smartphones already. And so... They don't have Wi-Fi, but they will. That's one of the projects, is to use these clusters, which I'm going to show in a second. Um, you make these building typologies. You make them prefabricated. And these, actually, these courtyards will become hi-fi clusters. And actually, you, micro credits can be grouped together by individuals. And we can make them actually one TV inter, uh, internet connection and one cable connection to be shared among all of them. Right now, they're doing it individually, which is insane. And so we came up with this new prototype, this clustering, and then we brought urban farming in, of course. It, not because it's going to solve the food problem, because again, it's a tool, it's a cohesive tool. And then we thought about technologies of how we could build, how we could make a scaffolding system. We're still working on that technology, how you can build over the houses, you can move the structures, you can demolish the, the house once the structure, top structure is ready, etc. And um, yeah, this is, and I continue on to show you then the solar model which is incredibly interesting. The solar motor is cool because if you rent the roof of the house, people will get a subsidy on electricity. They'll be producing electricity to the grid, and they'll make some money off of it. So they take care that no one steals their solar panels. You integrate it into the design of the roof, and you do feed-in tariff. It's not that they're going to have batteries in their house. That would be too expensive. No, you feed the, the electricity into the grid, and then they get a subsidy on their And then you can, instead of companies renting land to put solar fields, you rent the roofs of the houses. So it's all an idea of making this building two-story shacks. You liberate land. You have public space. You can go three stories. You can put rental units. Those rental units also subsidize the construction of the rest of the houses. And then you re-block. And here's Pumezo, who cried when he, they demolished his shack. And he volunteered to be the leader of the initiative. And we built it illegally, no permitting from Cape Town government. And we just built it. We demolished it. We built the structure on sand. We made it in very lightweight material so people could see. And there's the house. And the whole community rallied around to see the new prototype. And of course, this was a three-day house. Now the new house that we're working on um, is We've done the census. We worked with all the community members. I'm just showing you house by house and the game. And we now know where everyone wants to live. There's Danny from the office doing the whole workshop. There's me working with all of them. You have to get out of your office. You have to get on the ground. Here we clustered the units. Now we have three and four apartments clustered around one stairwell. And we re-block it into a central road, and we do all the mathematics. We figure out who goes where, the roads, the sewage system, the blocks. The blocks will take on uh, micro-loan credits, and the houses will have greenage. We'll direct all the uh, gray water to, to places where we can grow and put trees. And we have a kind of vision of a transition model 
for housing. It may be not the kind of house they were expecting because these are 50 square meter houses to, on 225 square meter floors and they can retrofit it. They can get the kitchen, the bathroom, the toilet. They can do insulation. They can build it over time. They get a simple house at the very beginning. They're connected by walkways, but at least they're waiting for a house in dignity. And that's the point. In fact, they're probably not going to move ever because it's taking 20 and 30 years for the government to hand over people those houses. So with that, I keep in mind that maybe the architect has to step away. He makes the framework for the house, but he lets people finish it and build it themselves over time. And what we give the details, we empower people, we teach them the technologies, but what we see is a whole community building those houses themselves. But then we bring the discourse to Switzerland to raise the funds, to have people be able to donate. You can do crowdfunding. You can make magazines. And so here you see how happy they are when we finish the first prototype. And there's already people from other communities who are coming to copy it, and they're building it makeshift. So the proof of the experiment is already that it's being copied. And we're very happy because we open source all of our designs. So with that, I'll finish the talk and we'll move on to showing you the Torre David movie so that all of you can see the realities. Thank you. And we'll put now the Torre David movie and we can have a little bit of a question uh, session at the end. I hope you guys will stay. I warn you, it's a 20-minute film, but you might like it because it's, uh, it's a place you've never seen before. Este es el mundo de la necesidad de los que no tenemos una vivienda. No tenemos donde vivir y tenemos que ir. No, yo creo que tenemos una oportunidad de, aparte de ni una tragedia, ¿verdad? Creo, vengo para acá porque el agua se me llevó todo. de tener algo propio estamos luchando poco a poco para ver qué, qué resultado nos da el tiempo
esfuerzo, aquí todo es un esfuerzo, para eso su, todo aquí todo es un esfuerzo para cada quien. Uh -huh. Yo hice esfuerzo para tener mi, mi, mi espacio, o sea, todo, ganar mi traer a planta, cargar agua con mi esposo, eso era diario, tres, cuatro veces al día, para adaptar agua, subirla, todo, todo es un esfuerzo muy grande que sí, para uh -huh. poder tener lo que tenemos hoy día. Entonces sacaban los escombros, 
tengo tres años está aquí en Venezuela y tres años está viviendo aquí en la torre. Eh, estoy construyendo una placa para engrandecer mi espacio, porque tengo tres muchachos, tres, tres carajitos, para tener más, más amplitud, pues, para vivir mejor. de tener una vivienda que no tengo vivienda entonces pues, como mi hermana ya tiene cuatro años de estar aquí ella me dijo entonces yo pues, hice la forma de, de conseguir pues la forma de construir y pues venirme para acá porque yo era conserje de un edificio y no tenía donde vivir entonces por eso duré dos años de conserje entonces cuando construí aquí me vine para acá ¿y de dónde viene usted originalmente? ¿De yo soy de Colombia de Colombia yo soy de Colombia Barranquilla pero tengo ya años de estar aquí ¿no? cuenta, cuenta Cuento un poco. Tengo conjuntos de niñas, batas de mujer, eh, bolsas de regalo, flores, faldas, eh, partes de niña, medias de caballero, medias de niño, eh, eh, pero de todo un poquito. Son manteles, las que son capas de baño. Esta tira, esta pieza, después no de hueá, y después se. Eh, y esta es esta esta también ayuda que bueno que ah, saben bueno. hacer cosas que son productivos increíbles y le va bien con el negocio no, no. porque le trabajamos a terceras personas ah le entrega a terceras sí, sí, esto, es, esto no es directamente mío mm. esta pieza me la pagan a un precio o una fábrica y entonces viene, no es mucho. llaman a nosotros invasores, tenemos necesidades, es grande y fuerte, eh, gracias a Dios aquí, estas personas aquí se han, se han organizado un poco más, si han hablado muy mal del edificio, no lo vamos a negar, muy mal, se expresan de que roba, si de un comienzo sí se veía eso, pero yo creo que ahorita hay más organización, hay más seguridad, vemos que, que las personas que el presidente, su presidente, no quiero decir nombre, para, para no mentir eso, 
ellos han organizado y le han dado friends de eso. Si alguien va a preguntar, ¿dónde vive usted? En la torre con finanzas, con demasiado orgullo. Orgullosa me siento yo de estar viviendo acá. Sí, ¿Sí, la, gente, la gente conoce en eso. Torre con finanzas me decía, ¡ay! Sí, Mentira, sí. vives ahí. Y sí, sí. Sí, lo dicen. No, tú estás loco, ¿qué Yo sí vivo ahí. Y con mucho orgullo digo, vivo ahí. Todo el mundo vive tranquilo aquí. Para sus cosas, para darnos el agua, para darnos la luz. Con todo el mismo condominio, ellos se encargan con la directiva, se encargan de hacer todo eso. ¿sí me bueno, mira, tú sabes que yo le pasé una carta por el internet comandante, ¿no? Y le hablaba de por qué no hacer aquí un segundo parque central. Un complejo como parque central, donde hay edificios donde vive familia y está el centro comercial. Hay espacio para eso. ¿Y respondió? No. Todavía no.
Okay. Any Thanks questions? for a fantastically inspiring and sensibilizing trip through the Southern Hemisphere. Time came to an end too quick, way too quick. But I still would like to open up for a short round yeah, of if questions. If anyone has any questions, you've, you've all held out. So <laughs> too I'm much willing, to think about. I'm willing. What, what may be the most important thing to tell you all is that you see, we, we don't need to invent that much. If we go out and watch the way the city is already experimenting, already using uh, uh, the city, we will find interesting ways that only need to be translated. In fact, the city I showed you at the very beginning of the lecture, this utopian city in vertical that actually has clusters of floors and shops and wind energies, uh, is actually the city that I'm already seeing. So. Torre David actually became a real important evidence of an experimentation that we thought cities should continue to do. Um, unfortunately, the rules and the regulations and the policies of city management is all geared towards the formal. So, um, but we, I think we're gonna find in the 21st century, just like political structures are breaking down and people want more direct contact with their own destinies. I think we're gonna see city making also transforming. One short question, now we're here. Uh, some advice to students? Yeah, well, the first thing, even if you do wanna practice locally, go look at the globe. You can't be an architect today without having, thinking about the globe. So um, there's a great essay by Julio Cortázar again, who was actually a UN emissary. He was a UN uh, kind of a representative, and he was sent all over the world, but he went to Calcutta in particular. Um, and he wrote an essay called, Calcutta is an obligated tourism for everyone. Why? Because you have to stand there in, in Howard Station, which is the train station of Calcutta, and you've never seen something like that in your life. That'll transform your way of confronting humanity. And maybe only that way we will go back to the ideal of the Renaissance, of creating a, a kind of Renaissance person, a Renaissance designer, a humanist. And so what we have now, we're living in a kind of new medieval. Gated communities are being formed, walls are coming up, and we actually, again, have to resort back to humanism as designers. In that sense. Thank you so much for coming. Thanks to all of you for sharing this evening. But I'm not for an architecture of humanity, a kind of uh, uh, like a little, a little, uh, a little roof over, over on four sticks. No, we bring the highest design qualities to the poorest areas. So they're beacons, they're lighthouses. I believe in design wholly. So it's not that I do it an impoverished design. No, that's where we differentiate with all the other, let's say, more humanitarian causes. We have to get you back for a critique in our department very soon. Thank you very much I hope for I can tonight. Make it. You can make it. Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> Great. Thanks. Okay. You must be hungry. You, you don't look tired. Yeah, let's go eat.